beautiful country and a city for Spain. Yes, I get about heaven. Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. I will bless the Lord at all times, as President and Executive Secretary, Treasurer, all of the administration and officers of the conference allowing me to come all across the sea to come and be with you at this wonderful camp meeting. God's Spirit is indeed in this place. Amen, church? And we have feasted at the welcome table. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to uh, going to preach a message that I hope will inspire, not only inform, but inspire us to do evangelism in even a greater way. I, I'm going to stay within the context and the theme of, of lead, but I want to uh, share with you that what we'll preach today is really about the mindset that we need to have when we're doing evangelism. Sometimes we focus on the methodology the strategy without understanding that we have to have the same mindset towards people that God does. And so uh, I'm going to share that in this message, and I'm sure the Spirit of the Lord will speak to you in other ways. We just wanted to mention to you, a few people asked me to remind you that after sunset, immediately after sunset, whenever I travel, I've been asked to bring si some of my copies, DVDs, CDs of my series that I do. At my church, I preach almost always in series. And so we have several ones that will be available for you. We have the one that we did at uh, Santon Church, Sex in the City. We were talking about spirituality and sexuality, topics that oftentimes we are a little afraid of talking about in the church, but it affects all of us. We want to address it from a biblical perspective uh, relevant to the 21st century. And so uh, we'll share that with you as well as the Power of the Sabbath series that we've done. Uh, of course, we know the right day. A lot of us are not walking in the right way in terms of the full power and, and, and relevance of the Sabbath in our lives. And so we're going to share that along with many other series that will be there. So after sunset, we'll be in the ABC, and uh, that will be available. 
And also, I was asked to let you know our first book, my wife and I, who is also, she, she's an occupational therapist by career, but she preaches as well. Powerful preacher. She preaches to me in the kitchen all the time. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so we have a book that's coming out uh, that we will bring back with us when we come in a few weeks. We'll be in Johannesburg, and uh, that will be available to you on the subject of sexuality and spirituality. And whenever we talk about that, a lot of folks say, well, that's for the young people. I think not. It's really for all of us. And it's going to be a rich blessing, so we know that you'll look for that. As we go to God's word, I want to invite you uh, to, uh, to turn to Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. We're going to go to an old well to get some fresh water. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Let me give this disclaimer that I gave this morning. I think it was helpful. Um, I I am a youthful or young man, but uh, I do not believe in preaching youth sermons. Um, You know, just a lot of times folks will see a young preacher say, oh, he's a youth preacher. Um, I believe that the word of God is applicable to every age group, every demographic. And so this word, this word is not for somebody you know. Sometimes when we're shaking hands at the door, somebody will say, well, I wish so-and-so were That was for them. No, it's not for somebody you know. It's for you. Amen? In some way, form, or fashion, it's for you. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. And it is the afternoon, and you have eaten and had a wonderful meal. And so the temptation right now is for those eyelids to close. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to pretend like I'm back at Mount Olive in Atlanta, We're going to do what we do at my church right around this time. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word, would you please? Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. You're standing because I want you to be alert and awake when the word of God is preached. Luke 15, 1 and 2. And if you have it, please say amen. Just these two verses. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now that's the King James Version, if you would allow me to give the Wesleyanite interpretation. Then drew near to him all of the scandalous, messed up, devious, promiscuous, lying, cheating people to hear from Jesus. And the good church people who thought themselves better than everyone else complained, saying, this man hangs out with sinners and spends intimate time with them. I want to preach from the subject that is not listed in your bulletin under the instruction of the Holy Spirit. I want to preach the subject, I'm glad he let you down. I'm glad He let you down. Remain standing for prayer. Now, Father, put your words in my mouth so that your people will hear your voice. Father, we do not come for more information. We come tonight for spiritual transformation. Do it in Jesus' name for our benefit and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. After now about 16 and a half years in pastoral ministry, having been able to travel both nationally and internationally to pastor in several different parts of the United States, different demographics, cultural groups, and understandings and backgrounds, I've come to this very sobering conclusion that while most of us who come to church genuinely love Jesus, most of us would not want Jesus to be a member at our church. I will say it again, for it is a sobering statement and I will qualify it in a moment, that most of us who love Jesus really would not want him to be an actual member of our local church. We would not want him to come to our board meetings. 
because he would say things that see him perhaps as being soft on sinners. We would not like Jesus at our meetings for he would stop the, the politics and he would make us pray before we vote. We would not like him. And, and, and I qualify this because I am in the Bible, you know, right there in those two texts that you read, the Pharisees and the scribes did not like him because you must understand that Jesus in his time, in, in, in his time and day and culture, Jesus was a great disappointment. He was. We worship him now as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But when Jesus first showed up on the scene, if you really understand what was going on then, he was a huge disappointment. Uh, yes, 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 even John the Baptist, his cousin, when he was preaching uh, one day by the riverside, saw Jesus coming. You remember that? And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. But then when his cousin was in prison, watch this, and heard what Jesus was doing in his ministry, he questioned his own cousin and said, shall, Are you the one, or shall we look for another? Mm-hmm. Because when they saw the ministry of Jesus, it was not like what they expected. They expected condemnation. They expected whipping the people into shape. They expected him to do uh, the things that they would do. Jesus was a huge letdown to the religious, sanctimonious people who thought they knew and had all the truth. He was a huge letdown. The Bible says in verse 1, though, that when Jesus showed up, crowds of people would come to hear him. It is interesting that Jesus, this is pre-Facebook and pre-Flyers, Jesus did not have to advertise to people where he was going to be. It is interesting that when Jesus went one place, people would show up to hear him. Ah, and we have to beg people and plead with people and sometimes bribe them with gifts to come to our evangelistic meetings. Jesus would simply set up shop and the crowd would come. He didn't have to give an invitation. They simply knew if Jesus was going to be there, there was going to be power. Maybe it was because of the way Jesus loved people before he preached to people so that when he stood up to preach, the people came to him because he, they knew he loved them. Mm. He always drew a crowd. And you do know that in every crowd, there are those who have come to get a blessing and there are those who have come to recruit to critique. Even right now in this audience are the same two groups. Ah, Jesus, when he was there, the Bible says that the crowd came to hear him and the Pharisees and scribes showed up to see if his theology was congruent with their human understanding. Isn't it crazy, isn't it funny that these finite beings who had studied the law thought that they could criticize and critique the one who was the author of it? And here is their accusation of him. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Ah, you missed that. Let me say it again. This was their accusation against Jesus. This man receives sinners and eats with them. You still missed it. See, that was a part where we should rejoice and praise God because, uh, newsflash, you and I are sinners in need of God's grace. And we ought to be grateful that he still hangs out with sinners and eats with them. The fact that they accused Jesus and thought that it was a condemnation that he hung out with sinners implies that they thought they were not part of that group. And the sanctimonious... Those who look down their sanctimonious nose of snobbery at other people are always those who refer to others as those people. Ah, Jesus drew those kinds of people, though, and their accusation was that he accepted sinners. Now, now you, the, the three stories that follow, we know them, the good shepherd, the lost coin, and the prodigal son, Understand that you will never fully understand the import, the power 
of those stories until you realize why Jesus told the stories. And here's why. If you're with me, say yes. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Jesus hears the accusation of the Pharisees and the scribes, and he realizes something. Understand this, that Jesus came not only to save us from our sin, that was the primary reason, but he also came to save us from something else. He came to save us from a faulty understanding of the character of God. Let me say that again. He came not only to save us from our sin, that's primary, but he also came to save us from the wrong idea of who the Father is. Now, when he hears this accusation by these religious scholars, he knows they don't understand who the Father is. So he makes up these three stories to teach them and the crowd the character of his Father. Watch Jesus, the master teacher, teach. He starts with this story. You've heard it before of this good shepherd who has a hundred sheep. And one goes straying. And he says, now if it's a good shepherd, the good shepherd will leave the 99 and go after the one. And when he finds the one, he will come back, ask his friends to join him, and they will throw a party. Now the reason he says this is because he's trying to teach them and he's trying to teach us this principle. That if we are called as the church, Church, to give this everlasting gospel in the last days, then we cannot afford to stand by trying to please the 99 when the one is still out there in the world. Mm -hmm. Let me come a little bit closer. So some of the problems that we're having in our church is that the pastors and the leaders are bound by this, uh, this, this need to make the 99 happy. Because if the 99 are not happy, they will write letters to the conference. Because if the 99 who started the church aren't happy with where the church is going, there will be problems. But do you not know, you are not called to please the 99. You are called to go after the one that is lost. The ministry of the church is not to babysit the 99. It is to go after the one, I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand this, it's to go after the one that Jesus died for. And if your church is full of the 99 but does not focus on the one, then you are not following the good shepherd. Jesus tells this story, and he can tell that some of them don't get it, some of them don't agree, so he tells another story. Watch Jesus, the master teacher, teach this lesson he says there's a woman who's got 10 silver coins. You've heard the story. And if she loses one, does she not light a candle and go after the one? Now, you will not understand the importance of this until you understand the cultural understanding of what's going on. See, one of the gifts that a groom would give to prospective br uh, 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 prospective bride was a necklace with 10 coins on it. Stay with me. And the 10 coins would be an engagement gift. Now, if she were to lose one piece of those 10 silver pieces, it renders the other nine, the other nine invaluable. Mm, do you see what Jesus is doing? So he says, so, so, so understand that the, the woman now has to find that one because when the groom, does that sound familiar, comes back, he's not just looking for the nine, he wants to find all 10. And if there's not 10 there, then the necklace is no longer valuable. May I suggest to you that the value and the worth of our worship services cannot be measured by how many Adventists we have there? But it must be measured by the one that we are called to light a candle and go looking for. Just because your church is full does not mean that you have fulfilled the mission. Because there's somebody lost right around you. And when the groom comes back, he wants to find what he's given. But Jesus can tell that the crowd, just like I can tell right now, totally didn't understand. So he tells one more story. Watch Jesus, the master teacher, teach. Uh, Jesus conjures up this story and says, there's a man who has two sons. You know this story? And, and there's an older, there's a younger, and, and there is a 
Uh, there is a covenant made that when he dies, the inheritance will go to his sons, the larger portion to the older and, and the lesser portion to the younger. You know the story, the young man, brash and bodacious, bodacious and belligerent, he comes and he demands his inheritance now. He says, Father, I want what is mine now. Interestingly enough, it's not the boy's stuff. It's the father's stuff. But he demands the father give him what is his. He doesn't deserve the inheritance, but he demands it anyway. Does that sound familiar? Everything we have, we don't deserve. And he says, I want it now. In other words, he was telling his father, I wish you would hurry up and die. Now, now you must understand Jesus is making up this story. This is not a historical account. He's making up this story as a parable to teach a greater point about the character of God. So pay close attention to the details of the story. The boy says, give me my stuff now, which shows the kind of, the kind of relationship he has to the father. You see, his relationship is, I simply want you to give me stuff. And some of us don't pray unless we can ask God for stuff. For many of us, our relationship with God, our relationship with the Father is, give me what I don't deserve. This boy is characterized as all those who demand from God what we don't deserve, but yet we are bold enough to ask for it before the time we can handle it. Be careful what you pray for. You may just get it. Now watch the Father. Are you still with me? Say yes. Watch the Father. Watch what Jesus says about the Father. It'll give you a clue to the character of God our Father. He says that the Father gives him his inheritance even though he does not deserve it. Mm -hmm. Say with me. Now we must understand that in this story, God, the Father, is symbolized as the father in the story. God knows everything. So as Jesus is telling the story, they understand and you must understand that what he's implying is, here it is, that the father knows the boy is going to use his inheritance in a bad way, but he gives it to him anyway. Did you catch that? Let me say it again. That the father knows what he's going to do and gives it to him anyway. What do you do with a God who will finance your foolishness? Now, that doesn't sound right. God wouldn't do that. God, God, no, it's not his intent to help the boy, but it is his, his intent to respect the boy's power of choice and allows the boy to take his inheritance and to waste it. Come here, let me help you. Do you not know that God knows your thoughts? That God knows your plans for tomorrow? He knows your plans to do wrong, and even though he knows you plan to do wrong tomorrow, he still wakes you up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm in the Bible, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that you plan to do wrong. He knows where you're going to do it, with whom you're going to do it. He, know, he knows all of that, and yet he wakes you up the next morning, he gives you strength so that you can exercise your own power of choice to dishonor him. That's, that, that's the father. That he, he knows this boy. This father knows his son. He knows what he will do. But isn't it something that God is so gracious? Oh, thank you, Jesus. That he knows that I'm going to do wrong. He knows prone to wonder Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, and yet he wakes me up in the morning with brand new mercies, hoping that I'll choose mercy, but respecting my choice enough that I can use the breath he gave me to dishonor him. And he takes his father's stuff and wastes it on riotous living. I like that word in the King James Version, riotous. I don't quite know what it means, but perhaps if we think of all the devious, scandalous, crazy things your flesh wants to do and that you would do if church people weren't around, 
Do I have any real people here today? That's riotous. And the Bible says that he goes to a far country. Now, when Jesus is telling this story, he knows the primary audience knows that if Jesus says far country, it can't be close. So it's not within the boundaries of Jerusalem or even where they are in Israel. It's in a pagan place. So he goes to a far country, which means it takes him a long time to get there because you do know that sin will be very, very patient in leading you away from the presence of the Father. And then when he gets there, he wastes all his substance because sin will make you pay more than you plan to pay. It'll make you stay longer than you plan to stay. And he's way out from the reach of his father. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes at this point of the story, and maybe we have a few Pharisees and scribes here, would probably say this boy is outside the reach of God. I remember when I was coming up, they would tell me if you go to certain places, that the angels, the holy angels would not go into those places, right? And so if you went to the nightclub, the angels would stay outside, and you would go in unprotected, into that place and I believed it until I read the scripture that said if I make my abode in heaven you are there but if I make my abode in hell yet you are there too think about it if you could go anywhere where the presence of God was not there and your angelic protection was not there to hold you together. Do you not know the enemy would bring the roof down on your head and snuff you out? But God says, wherever you go, I might not agree with it. Wherever you go, I might not want you to go. But he goes so he can protect you so you can have another chance and another day for his mercy and his grace. He's in a far country But he's not beyond the reach of his father. And some of you are in a far country right now. I mean, you're here presently, but you're in a far country. Your body is parked in the seat here, but your mind is somewhere else. And the grace of God is he'll go wherever he needs to go in order to get you. Somebody ought to say amen. Amen. He's in a far country. You know the story. He's in a far country, and he wastes all of his substance on riotous living. He's got all these friends who he thinks are friends. They help him waste his father's blessings. He ends up in a pig pen. No self-respecting Jewish boy would ever find himself in a pig pen. They weren't even supposed to touch pigs. Now he's living with pigs. Because sin will make you live with what you're above. Hang out long enough in the mud and you will eat like pigs, cuss like pigs, do business like pigs, hang out with pigs. This boy is beneath, this boy is beyond this, but he's living beneath his destiny. He's in the mud. Ah, he, he, he has exercised his independence, but now he is bound by his own liberty. He's incarcerated by his own independence. He is now in the mud and the mess of his own choices. But I like that there's grace even in the mud. For the Bible says, if you're still with me, say yes. The Bible says that he comes to himself. Uh, Which implies that when you are in the mud, you are not yourself. Mm. You are not what God destined you to be when you are in the mud. He comes to himself in the mud. I like that because it could be that some of you are one mistake away from finding yourself. One mistake away because God, watch this, God the perfect parent, unlike some of us who rescue our children prematurely from the consequences of their own unwise decisions, God the perfect parent will let you hit the bottom so you can realize the grace that you need. He finds himself not in the father's house, pampered by his father's blessings. No, he finds himself in the mud of his own mistakes. Oh, hallelujah. And there's glory in the mud. Because as he's there in the mud, the Bible says he comes to himself. Now realize this is not a historical account. This is a made-up story that Jesus is telling to make a bigger point. So why does Jesus bring up this mud? And how does this boy find himself in the mud? 
Remember, this is Jesus talking. Jesus, who in pre-incarnate state was there at creation. What did he make man from? The word Adam literally means from the ground or from the mud. So Jesus telling the story, hmm, I hope you catch this, puts the mud in the story because he wants us to know that he made us from the mud. And if we ever find ourselves back in the mud, it's the best place for him to make us all over again. In the mess of your muddy situations, God is able to reform your mind. He is able to transform your thoughts so that your worst day can become your best day because all things work together for good to them that love God. Is there anybody here that God has saved you from your mud? Come on, take your halos off for just a moment. And I know you're ready for translation, but let's just be real and thank God that he found you in your mud. And you're no longer living in your mud because of the grace of God. He applied his blood to your mud. He finds himself. And, and, and here's where we usually kind of end off the story with celebration and rejoicing because watch what he does next. He says, I realize that uh, the servants back in my father's house eat better than I do. So he says, I will arise, and I'm going to tell my father I have sinned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and you got to do that because you got to own your wrong. Amen? He says, I have sinned. That's confession. He said, I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned. And, and he starts walking on his way home. And that's usually when we rejoice because he's on his way back. says it's what the prodigal says on his way home that shows us he doesn't quite yet get it watch what he says he says uh, I'm gonna tell my father I have sinned I, I, I've sinned I've done wrong a and I am no longer worthy to be called a son make me a slave in your house let me say it again so you get it he's on his way home in the right direction but he's going in the right direction with the wrong attitude because he is thinking that the father when he sees him will have so much condemnation for him that the only thing he could be treated as is a slave but what he does not understand is he has too low an expectation of the character of God and so many of us today are on our way to the father's house yes you're on your way to glory but some of us are going with the wrong attitude we've got a slave mentality if you don't get it let me illustrate what does a slave do in order to get food a slave has to work in order to get food to eat but what does a son do a son does not have to work because slaves get food by way of their performance. Mm. But sons get food by way of their relationship. Slaves have to, let me come a little bit closer. Slaves have to make up for the sins they've done in their past so that God will see them worthy. But sons don't have to work. They accept the finished work of Christ on Calvary. Mm, let me get a little bit closer. This is why you have some people who come to church and they have no joy. They think it's a sin to smile in church. This is why they show absolutely no emotion. And I'm not saying you've got to do all the stuff that other people do, but they're emotionless, and, and that's why they have no peace, and that's why they, they seem to be very somber and stiff. Usually, those are people who are going in the right direction with the wrong attitude. Because they're thinking, I've got to work my way, obey my way, perform my way into the father's house. That's what slaves do. But the father says, you are a son. 
you are a daughter. Slaves work for the food at the welcome table. Sons and daughters pull up and take a seat because they are related to the father by blood. So he's walking in the wrong direction, right direction. He's got the wrong attitude. But praise be to God, here's the grace of the father. Is that the father meets him on his way. Even though he's got the wrong attitude, he meets him while he's going in the right direction. And the Bible says he throws his hands around him. Now the son tries to give him his pitiful speech. Father, I have sinned. And he needed to say that because confession is necessary. But then the next part was unnecessary. Make me a son and before he can make me a slave. And before he's finished, the father interrupts him and embraces him and here is where the son is let down by his father he expected the father to condemn him but thank God the father lets you down because you have too low an expectation of the grace of God and somebody here ought to praise God that he lets you down you expected condemnation he gave you grace you expected punishment. He gave you mercy. You expected him to put you out. But with loving kindness, he brought you back in. You ought to praise God today that he lets you down so that he can bring you up to understand that God doesn't just have love, but God is love. The father runs out and embraces the boy. He hasn't cleaned up yet. He doesn't have all his bad practices behind him yet, but he throws his arms around him and embraces him. I wondered why this father embraces him. Well, Jesus, remember, telling the story, knows what should have happened to the boy. Because according to the law of their time, if a boy ever displeased or dishonored his father like this, he was supposed to be stoned. So the reason the father embraces him is he says, if you're going to stone my boy, you're going to have to stone me too. You ought to be grateful that God got to you before the church did. If the church got a hold of you, you would have been disfellowshipped by now. If the church got a hold of you, you wouldn't be a camp meeting right now. But is there anybody here who's grateful that God got to you before the church did? That's the father of grace. That's the father of love because this boy was a son when he left the house. He was a son when he was caught up in riotous living. He was a still a son when he was messing with prostitutes. He was still a son when he was getting drunk. He was still a son when he ended up in the, in the mud of his own mistakes. He was still a son. He wasn't a good son, but he was still a son. And the goodness of God is that he loves all his lost sons and daughters back to him with loving kindness that's why the Pharisees did not understand why Jesus eats and drinks with sinners because he is the good shepherd that goes after the lost sheep he is the woman who lights the candle and finds the lost coin in the house and he is the good father this story is not the prodigal son because if you call it the prodigal son you make sin the star of the story this is not the prodigal son this story is actually about the prodigal's father because the father of grace can understand and you got to understand this you cannot out sin God's grace the father welcomes him home and what happens like every part of the story they rejoice because all of heaven rejoices even over one sinner that understands who the Father is. He's a God of both mercy and justice, grace and truth. And when you understand that, then you realize that as long as you hear that pricking in your heart, as long as you hear that still small voice, as long as you are able to say and come to yourself, 
you can always go home. I'm glad God let me down because my expectation of him was way too low. He is greater than you've ever dreamed. He is more merciful than the church will ever be. He is more gracious than the religious scholars of their day and today will ever be, for he is grace. And he is love. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Understand this. The Pharisees and scribes had the wrong understanding of who God is. They would tell the folks that they had to perform their way into righteousness. But the Bible says that none of you, none of us at our very best would be able to be worthy and called righteous. For our best is as filthy rags. But here's the glory of God is that grace, which is unmerited favor, that grace can be applied to any sin because you cannot out sin God's grace. He says all you got to do is start walking in the right direction. If you're, if you're here this, this afternoon under the sound of my voice and you believe, that God is a God of truth and grace. I just want you to stand, if you just believe that. He's a God of truth and grace. I just want you to stand. Now, just before we pray, I'm not going to be naive enough to believe that because you're at camp meeting, you are in relationship with God. And so I want to ask and make this quick appeal, and it, it doesn't have to take long, it shouldn't be long, because you, you, you've heard the word of the Lord this morning and all weekend, and now you've heard this word, and here's what God is saying. If you're here, you might be here this afternoon, but you know some part of your life, some facet of your existence is in a far country. You know that. In, in fact, maybe people around you, people at your church, or people who know you don't know, but you know, and God knows. Here's, here's the word of the Lord to you this afternoon. Understand that because you cannot out sin his grace, all you have to do is not clean yourself up because the story never said he cleaned himself up from the mud. He simply started walking in the right direction. And the Father will meet you on your way if you just start walking. I want to pray for people who want to get to the Father's house with the right attitude. And if there's some mud that's holding you back from being what God has called you to be as a disciple, I want you to do this for me because I want to pray for you. I want you to slip out of the aisle and come down front signifying I'm walking. I'm going to start walking in the right direction. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. We're going to wait for just a moment because I know there's more than one. You're coming. You're coming. Some part of your life is in a far country. You might even go to church. That doesn't mean you're not in the far country. There, there might be some habit, some practice, some secret sin, something, someone, whatever it is, that has you, your mind, your spirit in a far country. And, and, and here's the grace of God, is that though he takes a risk waking you up every morning for you to keep going back, to that same sin, here's the grace of God. There's also a chance you'll realize his mercy that day. Guess what? Today is your day. Just start walking in the right direction. Amen. Come on, come on. Just start walking in the right direction. Don't clean yourself up. That's not your business. It's not your business. In the story Jesus told, the boy didn't clean himself up. What did the father do? He covered him with his robe. So it's not your business to stop doing what you're doing. It's God's business to give you the strength to stop. Not you. For it is Christ that worketh in you, 
both to will. That's the desire. You don't even have the desire to do right without him. It's Christ that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let God, let the Father of grace do what he does best. Clean up messed up sinners. I'm getting ready to pray now. But even as I pray, you're coming to the Lord, you're coming back to the Lord, or you're surrendering some part of your life to the Lord that's in a far country. He'll love you all the way back home. It doesn't matter if you had a child out of wedlock. I know what the church says. We understand standards. We don't lower that. But the grace of God must be applied to every mistake we make. The grace of God. I know maybe some people at the church said some things to you they should not have said. They stood in judgment of you, and they were wrong. Yes, but, but the Father will love you. Don't leave the church over people when God is what the church is all about. Come on back home. Wherever you are, come on back home. Because his grace is wide enough to even include you. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you that the Pharisees and scribes had it half right. You really do receive sinners. And you really do spend time with them. Thank you that the accusation is correct. Because we are those sinners. We are the ones who need that grace. We're grateful, God, that you, the good shepherd, went and found us. We're grateful, God, that even when we got lost in the house, in the church, you still came and got us. And we're grateful, God, that even when we made up our minds purposefully to sin against you, your grace was waiting on us to bring us home. Now, God, we're we're standing all over this building because we're saying we believe in grace and truth. But God, help us now to not only believe it, but to live it, to accept it, and to practice it. God, some of us, we have asked forgiveness for sins, and we have not forgiven ourselves. God, deliver us from guilt and shame, which only leads us into the cycle of sin again. And God, convict us so that we will know that even though we are wrong, you are in the process of making us right. Now, God, apply your blood to our mud. Help us to come to ourselves so we, are re we will realize that we are living beneath our divine destiny. And God, I pray that these who have pressed to the front, that you will bring them from whatever far country they are in all the way to the Father's house. And we, one day, all of us, will sit down at the welcome table where Jesus will finally and eternally eat with sinners saved by grace. In Jesus' name, let all God's children say amen and amen. God bless you.